Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber case podcast. Julie Rayner Mugford was Jeremy Bamber's girlfriend at the time of the shootings at White House Farm. There are multiple facts which have never been included in books or documentaries. These include Julie's confession to criminal activities. Essex police arranged for her to have immunity from prosecution in return for her testimony against Jeremy Bamba, as stated by the DPP in a letter. In these circumstances, and with considerable hesitation, I would suggest that Julie Mugford be advised that she will not be prosecuted in respect of these matters. Thereafter, she will be called as a witness in the case against Bamba. The only statement by Julie Mugford which was disclosed to the defence and the court, was a composite statement. This was known as the served copy. Essex police constructed it from cherry-picked extracts taken from eight of Julie's disclosed statements. The consequence of this was that a vast amount of evidence was omitted from the served copy. As such, many important issues that would have cast doubt on her honesty were withheld from the trial, and it is these issues which are included here. Julie Mugford made a further six pre-trial statements, for which the defence has the Home Office reference numbers, known as Holmes boxes, which include the statement dates, but Essex police have refused disclosure. During his summing up, the judge stated to the jury, First of all, quite simply, do you believe Jeremy Bamba or do you believe Julie Mugford? If you are sure that Julie Mugford told you the truth, then it means you are sure that the defendant told her that he had planned the killings and had, in fact, carried them out. If you are sure that Julie was telling the truth, it follows that the defendant has told you lies and it follows that the defendant is guilty. Julie and Jeremy met for the first time in 1983 when Jeremy worked as a barman and 19-year-old Julie was waitressing part-time at Sloppy Joe's restaurant in Colchester. On Boxing Day, Jeremy and Julie went out as a couple for the first time. Following lunch, Julie took Jeremy to her parents' home to introduce him to her mother and stepfather. Jeremy says that he learned that Brian, her stepfather, was a violent bully. And later in the relationship, after seeing Julie's mother with a black eye, he vowed to protect Julie and her mother. Jeremy told Brian if he ever saw Mary with a black eye again, Brian would have him to face, and this seemed, at the time, to prevent further domestic abuse. It was early in 1984 when Jeremy took Julie to White House Farm for the first time and introduced her to his parents. June, a shrewd mother, took an instant dislike to Julie and told Jeremy that in her opinion she was no good for him. As Julie informed Essex police, June made her feelings clear, admitting, Mrs Bamba didn't approve of me living with Jeremy. At one stage she accused me of being a harlot or loose woman. It's hard to imagine what this ordinary girl from a broken home thought when she saw the tranquil surroundings and thriving businesses at White House Farm for the first time. She must have been further encouraged by Jeremy as a part owner of the lucrative caravan site. Julie once admitted to Anne Eaton that she would prefer Vaulty Manor House, Jeremy's grandparents' place, as her future home. The Bamba world was one which encompassed properties, businesses, cars and social events, as well as the finer things in life which working-class Julie had not had the opportunity to experience until now. Julie now had access to all of these things, accompanied with the security that her mother would also be safer with Jeremy around. Julie was in full-time education at Goldsmiths College, University of London, studying to be a teacher. She initially lived in the university's student accommodation. This is what one of her fellow students told us. I was unfortunate enough to become acquainted with Miss Mugford, between September 1983 and July 1984, Julie and Susan were opposite the kitchen, which was on the opposite side from my room. Uh, some of my recollection is vivid and some less so over time. The main thing is the domination of the kitchen by those two. As a fresher, I felt intimidated by them and that was their aim, so I would let them have the kitchen to themselves. They never mixed with anyone save when Jeremy came to stay. Jeremy was a darling to me, so sweet and polite. I often wondered what he was doing there. In contrast, 
Mugford was utterly vile to me. She was frightening and intimidating. I felt out of place if I tried to use the kitchen. She was a hundred percent unsociable. She was imperious, arrogant, rude and antisocial in every way. All she ever did was hang out with her vile sidekick, the Susan. Nobody ever went to visit them at their end of the corridor, and that's how they liked it. They were disgustingly unwelcoming to freshers when they had a duty, in fact, to welcome and support us. I felt this from day one, and I was shocked, as I was far from home and very tearful. Mugford and her accomplice made it ten times worse for me to settle in. I remember trying to befriend them, as is normal behaviour. However, I got mocked and felt very much looked down on by the dominant pair. Jeremy was kept zealously out of sight by Mugford. I remember the only time I was graced with an invite to her room, I saw lots of teddies and other such dolls which I thought odd for a girl in a year above me. The conversation was entirely focused on her, narcissistically. Never did she speak about me or my course or seem interested or supportive in any way. I distanced myself as best I could and never used the kitchen, having been driven out by the vile squatters. Soon, though, Julie moved to shared accommodation with fellow students, first in Caterham Road, Lewisham, and then in Harvard Road, Lewisham, but soon spending holidays and weekends at Jeremy's Cottage in Goldhanger. Just before Easter 1984, Jeremy moved into 9 Head Street, Goldhanger, a property owned by his father, Neville. From then on, Julie visited as often as she could, so much so that she referred to Jeremy's cottage as her home, and it was at this time she first met Sheila and the twins. In a statement, she said, I can't remember when I first met Sheila and the twins, but I believe it was around Easter time of 1984. I remember that I was at Jeremy's house when Jeremy was at work. When Mrs. Bamber came round with a girl who I later found out was Sheila, Sheila was not introduced to me, but both of them came in and looked around the house. The atmosphere was very tense because I believe Mrs. Bamber didn't expect me to be there as she didn't approve. During the summer break from college that year, Julie took a job in the south of France selling drinks on the beach. In June 1984, I went to France for three weeks for a working holiday and then returned to live at Goldhanger in July 1984. On her return, she told Jeremy about how she'd shared a two-man tent with a male friend, eating only when they managed to shoplift some food. Jeremy was very concerned about her sleeping rough with no money, and so he managed to secure her a part-time casual job at North Malden Growers. As she stated in evidence, I got casual work which Jeremy arranged for me at North Malden Growers Goldhanger. I did various picking and sorting jobs on the farm. Julie firmly believed that she and Jeremy would get married. She informed the police and the jury when she stated, Just prior to Christmas 1984, Jeremy asked me to marry him and after I told him I thought he was joking and he said he wasn't and I said I would marry him, we decided we would go to a registry office after Christmas, not tell anyone and get married. On the standard trial, she was questioned. At the time that Jeremy first proposed to you, were you 20 years of age? Yes. Did you want to marry him for your own reasons? Yes, very much. Did you want to settle down with him as husband and wife? Yes. Jeremy's friend Brett Collins told the police that he jokingly announced that Jeremy and Julie would be getting married and Jeremy had immediately replied, I will not be getting engaged to Julie. And Brett went on, Jeremy and Julie seemed to be close, more on Julie's side than Jeremy's. He seemed to want more of a friendship, but she was obviously thinking of marriage. Had Jeremy proposed, it is certain he would have bought Julie a ring and that Julie would have shared this news with her family and friends. However, there never was a ring and at trial, she replied to questions. Did you tell your parents that you hoped to marry him? No. Did you tell any of your friends that you hoped to marry him? No. Did you tell anyone else in the world that you hoped to marry him? Not in a serious sense. I might have said it jovially or somebody might have said it to me jovially, but not seriously. But within yourself, it was serious? Yes. And it remained serious? Yes. It remained serious even throughout 1985. Throughout their relationship, Julie Mugford was possessive over Jeremy and this intensified over time. She closely watched the people around him for any signs that they were a threat to their relationship. Julie continually wanted her own way. 
On one occasion, she demonstrated this in a busy supermarket. In her own words, she recalled this incident. I can verify that sometime during 1984, I was with Jeremy shopping in Colchester at a supermarket. We had a disagreement about which type of soap to buy. I ended up agreeing with his choice and threw him the bar of soap which he wanted. This really annoyed me and after throwing some items from the shopping trolley on the floor, I left the store, leaving Jeremy behind. Jeremy had always had a fear in the back of his mind that Julie could and would ultimately harm herself during one of her outbursts. She even admitted that just days after the loss of his entire family, she told him, I couldn't hurt myself anymore and didn't know what I would do and he asked me to promise not to kill myself. I told him I couldn't promise anything. The objective seems to be the exercise of control over Jeremy without even considering the upset it would have caused him at such a vulnerable time in his life. On the morning after the devastating events at the farm, the police collected Julie from London and drove her to Jeremy's cottage, where she remained for the next three weeks. Case material reveals her support was limited to practical matters, such as helping plan the funeral and arranging ordering of flowers. Any friends who did offer support were treated suspiciously by Julie, especially Brett Collins. Julie liked to go out and eat, and she gave evidence that during this week the four of us went out for meals on a regular basis. We didn't cook at home. Jeremy paid for everything. But Jeremy says he would have preferred spending this time quietly at home, that he was under constant public and press scrutiny in the days following the tragedies. But it seems that Julie never gave this a moment's thought. When the police needed someone to identify the bodies, the relative Robert Howie came forward, offering to do this. But Julie stepped in and asked if she could do it instead, saying in a statement, I made my request to Detective Sergeant Jones and the necessary arrangements were made. No one would be criticised for admitting that identifying the bodies of five people, including two small children, would be too distressing, especially for a 20-year-old woman. Yet Julie did not appear to be unnerved at all. As a trainee teacher on work placements with young children, Julie didn't flinch about seeing the dead family. And if she's to be believed, she knew her boyfriend had intended to shoot them. Why didn't Julie tell anyone about this? Why didn't she run to Anne Eaton or PC Clark who were outside the mortuary waiting to drive her back to Jeremy's and tell them Jeremy was involved? Instead, she chose to return to Jeremy Bamba despite prolonged periods where she had the opportunity to speak up. Julie later admitted to the police the reason she wished to identify the deceased was Whilst I was there, I felt I should touch the bodies to see if they could give me guidance on what I should do, but I could not summon up the courage to do it. I left and once outside made up my mind to go back and seek guidance from the bodies. However, I thought that if I requested to see the bodies again, someone may have started asking questions which I could not answer. The adults' funerals took place on the 16th of August at the small local church in Tulsant, Darcy. This was where June and Neville had acted as church wardens. The media was out in force. Brett Collins told Essex Police that Jeremy had been very upset and shocked prior to the funeral and cold to us all. He had been told by aunts, uncles and the like to look ahead and put it all behind him. Photographs of the funeral show a grief-stricken young man doing his best to conduct himself in a dignified manner. Yet Jeremy was later criticised and he was accused of being cold and unemotional. Julie Mugford told the police that she'd been very upset. However, it appears in the media footage that it is Julie Mugford who's calm with not a tear in sight. Julie told the police that after the funerals, a few close friends went for a meal that evening at the Caribbean Cottage restaurant. And in a witness statement, Julie attempted to use this against Jeremy. The evening was a very boozy affair. Jeremy did not speak to me much that evening as I was not in a party mood. He just wandered around talking to anyone who had time to lend him an ear. By implication, she was suggesting that Jeremy was in a party mood. However, Julie's evidence regarding Jeremy's demeanour was contradicted in the witness statement given by Rodney Brown 
the owner of the restaurant. Jeremy was very quiet, subdued and seemed to be under heavy strain. His friends tried to make him laugh and relax. He seemed, when they left, a little more relaxed and said to me, I'm glad I came now. On the day of the second funeral for his family, he again visited the Caribbean cabin, this time with Brett and I think Julie. Jeremy again was very quiet. However, Essex police preferred the account given in the statement of Julie Mugford and the evidence from Mr Brown was never used. Julie's 21st birthday was on the 26th of August and for her present, Jeremy had promised they would go on holiday. But because of the tragedies and owing to work commitments at the farm, Jeremy would not be able to take her himself. However, he suggested she could go with a friend of hers and that he would pay. Julie decided that she would go with Liz Remington. Jeremy gave Julie two cheques. She paid one for £530 into her bank account on the 27th of August 1985, the date she returned to Lewisham. However, the second, for £400, was not paid into her account until the 17th of September 1985, after she had implicated Jeremy in the murders of his family. During the trial, Julie lied to the jury about the cheques, informing the court that one cheque was drawn on Jeremy's personal bank account, and this was the only reason why she'd accepted it from him. But this wasn't true. Julie knew both cheques were drawn on the business account NJ Bamber Limited, as she referred to this in a statement confirmed by the bank manager. And Julie Mugford was happy to cash a substantial cheque and lie about it after she had given evidence against Jeremy. By the 31st of August, the relationship between Julie and Jeremy was all but ended, and following a meal together, Jeremy returned with Julie to her home where she said she begged him to stay. Julie admitted to the police that during that night, I told him that I would really love to hurt him and that I'd tried to stab the teddy bear he'd given to me as a present. He was still upset I tried to mother him as I felt sorry and assured him that I would never do anything to hurt him. I asked him what he was going to do with his life. We didn't sleep well and at one point I got a pillow and put it over his head. I took it off and he asked why I did it and I said, if he were dead, he would always be with me. I had his car keys so he couldn't go. Nothing else much was said after that, but eventually I gave him the keys back as I previously said he left the house. He left on amicable terms. On the 4th of September 1985, Jeremy and Brett met Julie at Sheila's flat as Julie wanted to see him to discuss their recently finished relationship. Whilst she was still there, a female friend of Jeremy's telephoned, and when Julie realised who it was, she slammed her hand down on the receiver to cut off the call. However, the friend, Virginia, rang back, and Mugford was fuming. She ran into the bedroom and threw Jeremy's wooden trick box into the mirror, smashing it into pieces. When Jeremy went to check that she was all right, Julie launched at him, repeatedly taunting him to hit her. Brett witnessed the episode and told the police in his evidence, I've never seen Jeremy hit or push her at all. In fact, I've never seen Jeremy angry or violent towards any person. I've not seen a nasty side of him at all. Sometime later, after Julie had calmed down, Jeremy drove her home and even after her tantrum, he still made arrangements to help her move house a couple of days later. On the 6th of September, Jeremy helped Julie move into her new shared student accommodation, as was prearranged, and that evening, Julie and her best friend, Liz Remington, went to Stringfellows and ended up snorting cocaine. In her statement, dated the 10th of September 1985, she said, We went to the Stringfellows Club where we met two guys. They invited us back to their hotel for a drink. Once in their room, they offered us some cocaine. I initially declined the offer, then became inquisitive. It was on this same night that Liz confessed to Julie that she had previously had a one-night stand with Jeremy. The scenario that Essex police and the prosecution have always adhered to is that Julie Mugford went to the police to volunteer evidence that Jeremy was involved in the tragedies. This is far from being the truth. 
after Jeremy finished his relationship with Julie Mugford on the 31st of August 1985, she now began telling friends Jeremy was involved in the shootings. Julie's housemate Susan Battersby, who'd committed check fraud with Julie, shared a meal out with her at Pizza Hut on Julie's return from Jeremy's cottage on the 27th of August. It seemed Julie was dropping hints that Jeremy might have killed the family and Susan Battersby told police, I followed her and made the remark something like Jeremy did it, didn't he? And she said, no, not Jeremy, he didn't do it. It's unlikely this conversation took place on the 27th of August, just two days after Jeremy and Susan had fallen out in a very public way during Julie's 21st birthday party. Given Susan's dislike of Jeremy, it's surprising that she didn't mention that she suspected he had murdered his family based on what Julie had told her two days previously. On the 1st of September, the day after Jeremy had ended the relationship, Julie Mugford told her story to her best friend, Liz Remington. According to statements, Liz told her if allegations were true, she should go to the police. But Julie kept refusing to do so. Did Julie tell Liz, perhaps because she wanted to put Liz off of Jeremy, because she knew that they'd had an intimate relationship previously? In the end, Liz took Julie to see Malcolm Waters, an older ex boyfriend of hers. And she told him that Julie had a story to tell. Malcolm, who didn't like Jeremy, was at first highly suspicious and believed that Julie was just repeating details of what she'd read in the media. Waters wanted her to go to the police. And when Julie refused, Waters took it upon himself to do so. Dear Stan Jones was the one who collected Julie as set out in his pocketbook. Called out to Colchester, re Bamba, to 31 Alexander Road, Colchester. The occupant, Malcolm Waters, rang about Remington and Julie Mugford. Dias Jones played a major role in shaping Mugford's testimony, and based on the evidence, it's likely that he also wrote a witness statement for her. He was instrumental in ensuring she was not prosecuted for burglary, theft, and drug related crimes and generally overseeing the evidence she would present to the jury. Before the trial, Jeremy's legal team requested documentation that detailed all the police contact with Julie Mugford. After much resistance from DCI Ainsley, who argued, the request is totally unreasonable. The list was eventually supplied, revealing a string of 32 meetings that had occurred that in the main part involved D.S. Jones. In fact, D.S. Jones and D.S. Bernard were happily ensconced in a hotel room with Julie, waiting for the jury to reach a verdict, so that Julie could immediately give her interview to the News of the World reporters and pose for photographs in her underwear as soon as the jury returned a guilty verdict. Julie made a lot of claims which, of course, were contradictory. This is what Julie told the police regarding the murders. That Jeremy had been planning the murder of his family since Christmas 1984 and told her he would have to kill Sheila and the twins too so he would inherit everything. She also told them that Jeremy said Sheila had done nothing on the farm so she didn't deserve anything and that she was crazy and Jeremy would be putting her out of her misery, and by killing the twins, it would be doing them a favour, as they would grow up disturbed because of the way they were being brought up. Initially, he had experimented with tranquilizers that Jeremy considered obtaining cyanide to poison the family. Jeremy had employed a hitman to carry out the murders. The hitman would enter and exit the house using the windows. Jeremy would leave a gun out. The hitman would be paid £2,000 on completion of the hit. That Jeremy, and not the hitman, would make his escape back to his cottage and it would be by means of a bicycle using back roads. 
Whilst giving her witness statements, Julie Mugford implicated her former boyfriend in the murders at White House Farm, but also offered any information to harm his character and credibility. One example is when she tried to implicate Jeremy in stealing items of value. As she told Essex Police, whilst in New Zealand, Jeremy has told me he stole two Cartier watches. He did it by walking into a jeweller's asking to see them. Then when the assistant got them out, he snatched them and ran off. Numerous detailed, expensive and time-consuming checks were made and the result of these exhaustive inquiries were that the watches had not been stolen but purchased by Jeremy. A second example is that Julie also told Essex police that when Jeremy was in New Zealand, Jeremy had stolen diamonds from people's rings. She stated Jeremy used to take diamonds from people's rings by conning them, although I do not know how, and replacing the diamond with a glass stone. He would then sell the stones for cash. Can you imagine strangers handing over diamond rings and the skills Jeremy must have had to extract the diamonds and replace them with perfectly matching glass stones, without the unsuspecting victim ever discovering what he'd done or reporting the matter to the police? This was another lie, but even Essex police realised the preposterous nature of these accusations and withheld these from the court. Jeremy's visit to New Zealand, it would seem, had been quite an eventful and lucrative trip as, according to Julie, Jeremy had stolen from the bank, committing traveller's cheque thefts. He also arranged for his traveller's cheques to be stolen and cashed by a friend and he then reported the theft and obtained new cheques. The banks were suspicious and Jeremy had to take part in an identity parade. Again, this didn't happen. These crimes were each thoroughly checked by Essex police, who would have loved them to have been true, but they discovered that Julie Mugford had made things up again. The jury were not informed about this chain of lies. One theft you might know of is the burglary at O.C. Road caravan site. Jeremy immediately admitted to it when questioned by the police and explained there had been numerous security issues at the caravan site in recent weeks and had discussed increasing the security, but his ideas were ignored. Jeremy decided the only way to highlight the failings of the present security measures was to demonstrate just how lax they were in the hope that he would be listened to. Julie stated she had been instructed by Jeremy to act as lookout and if anyone came along, I was supposed to tell. And that's as much as the jury thought her involvement amounted to. They didn't hear the fact that she admitted she played an active part in the burglary by putting her hand through the letterbox to retrieve the key. The DPP made a decision in December 1985 that she should not be charged. I also agree that the burglary charges can be withdrawn. But Jeremy, on the other hand, was charged with this offence. On the 23rd of September 1985, DSI Ainsley wrote a report to the DPP with the intention of providing sufficient evidence to charge Jeremy with the murders of five members of his family. The majority of the evidence contained in this report was based on the testimony of the Beauflowers Eatons and Julie Mugford. It was vital to the police that they created an image that Julie was a credible witness and Ainsley stated, I believe it would be fair to describe Julie Mugford as a normal student, reasonably presentable, who, prior to meeting Bamber, was leading a normal student life. There is no doubt that she's been corrupted criminally, sexually and in relation to drug abuse by Bamber. Fortunately, she appears to have recognised her descent and pulled back from the precipice. I would describe her as an intelligent young lady A typical student, reasonably presentable, who prior to meeting Bamba, led a normal student life. As a result of her liaison with Jeremy Bamba, Julie became morally and criminally corrupted. It is the opinion of myself and other officers on this inquiry that Julie Mugford is telling the truth and will repeat her allegations in a court of law and will be a good witness. The evidence Julie Monkford gave about the phone calls she'd received from Jeremy on the evening of the 6th of August and the early hours of the 7th of August changed dramatically over time. Regarding the phone calls she received on the evening of the 6th of August, she gave evidence on the 8th of August 1985 that I spoke to him for between 17 and 20 minutes. He told me he had supper with his parents during the conversation that evening. He said he had 
had as pleasant a day as could be expected due to harvesting. He did not make any more mention of the family. On the 8th of September, this changed to Jeremy saying, I've been thinking in the tractor and the crime will have to be tonight or never. I was aware that when he said the word crime, he was referring to the killing of his family. At approximately 3.30am on the 7th of August, Jeremy telephoned her again. According to her first statement, she said, The next time I heard from Jeremy was by telephone again about 3.30am on Wednesday morning the 7th of August 1985. He sounded disjointed and worried and said words to the effect, There's something wrong at home. And he did not know what to do. He sounded odd. I told him to go to bed. I was half asleep and didn't ask him what was wrong. When I told him to go to bed, I just said, bye, honey, or words to that effect. But during September, this changed to, everything is going well. Not to worry. There's something wrong at the farm. I told him simply to go to bed and he said, bye, honey, I love you lots. I then put the phone down. I particularly remember the phrase, everything is going well. Then I got into bed and laid there for, I suppose, five minutes when I suddenly came to my senses and realised what he'd said. In my view, he was telling me they were all dead. The time this telephone call was made became of the utmost importance to the prosecution. They needed Jeremy to have telephoned his girlfriend prior to 3.15am. Therefore, before the time Jeremy stated he had received a phone call from his father, alerting him to the unfolding events at the farm, the prosecution could then firmly state that Jeremy was lying about receiving the call from his dad and that it never happened. This factor would significantly strengthen the case against Jeremy and, as such, Julie repeatedly altered the time that Jeremy phoned her. Julie wasn't a good liar. She could not remember from one statement to the next what time she'd given in evidence for this telephone call, which fluctuated. So on the 8th of August 1985, she stated that the time of the call was 3.30. And then on the 8th of September 1985, she stated the time of the call was 3.15. And then again in another statement on the 8th of September 1985, She went back to saying that the time of the call was 3.30. But then again on the 23rd of September 1985, she changed the time again to much earlier, to 3 o'clock. At trial, the times presented to the jury were 3 o'clock, 3.15 and 3.30. Also revealed in Julie's statement is her confession to smoking marijuana prior to Jeremy's call in the middle of the night. This fact was also not disclosed to the jury. So it's not surprising then that Julie Mugford couldn't clearly remember what time Jeremy Bamba actually called her. D.I. Ainsley told the DPP that Jeremy had corrupted Julie Mugford. This wasn't true. She had a string of drug offences, some of which happened before she even met Jeremy, and these included smuggling drugs from Canada to England, smuggling drugs from Holland to England, cultivating cannabis, dealing drugs to college students, taking cannabis, marijuana and cocaine. Had the jury known just the extent of her involvement in the drug scene, it would obviously have had an impact on her credibility and the reliability of the evidence that she gave. During the trial in 1985, the jury were advised that during 1984, Julie Mugford was involved in a serious case of cheque fraud. Although the extent of this was not disclosed to them, she told Essex Police, Susan reported her handbag stolen and then over a day, they made as many purchases as possible using a cheque book and a £50 cheque guarantee card. Julie forged Susan's signature throughout the day and the theft amounted to a total of £634, meaning that at least 13 acts of theft and fraud had occurred. Even though Jeremy had no knowledge of this, DSI Ainsley still found a way of blaming Jeremy and told the DPP she committed criminal offences of deception to prove something to him. Even though Susan and Julie should have been charged, DS Jones advised the girls to repay the money and went to visit the bank manager to arrange this and to ensure that the bank did not press charges. 
In 2002, for the appeal, Mr Dovey, the bank manager, gave evidence that on Miss Battersby's arrival, I also met Miss Julie Mugford and a man who identified himself as a police officer. In 2002, though, D.S. Jones was asked about this and stated, I did not go with them on that occasion. In fact, my pocketbook shows I was not on duty that day. However, during an interview, former DSI Ainsley named D.S. Jones as the officer who attended the bank that day, and yet the Metropolitan Police took no action against D.S. Jones for this blatant lie. Many people would ask the simple question as to why it took Julie Mugford a month to report what she claims to have known of the tragedies to Essex Police. In the evidence given at trial, Julie stated she'd been unable to say anything as she'd been in Jeremy's company for the whole time since the 7th of August until she returned home three weeks later and she said she'd not been in anyone else's company without Jeremy being present. Jeremy knew I knew if I was in anybody else's company, I would say something. But this wasn't true and she'd had many occasions when she was not with Jeremy and here are just a few. She was at Head Street with Colin Caffell, both at the funerals and at his home. She'd also accompanied David Beauflower to get food together. And Julie was also with Anne Eaton on the journey to and from the mortuary and getting the flowers. During Jeremy and Julie's break at Eastbourne, Karen and Andy Bishop were there. Julie could have told them at any time. Liz Remington came for the funerals and she was alone with Julie. D.S. Jones and D.C. Clark, who she was alone with frequently, and as we've already heard, some 32 times. So why did Julie not tell a member of the waiting media, or make an anonymous phone call, or confide in her mother, or tell a reporter? Why did she not inform the mortuary attendants of what she knew? And why? Did she not tell the police officer who collected her from her home in London and drove her to Essex to Jeremy's cottage in Goldhanger on the day of the incident? The answer is simple because at that time she had no idea that the relationship with Jeremy was going to end and she knew he had no involvement in the tragedy. During 2010, the journalist David James Smith interviewed one of the relatives, David Beauflower, and during the course of this interview, David said, Julie was obviously putting on a fantastic act because she knew. She'd had the phone call earlier that night, and actually, I remember saying to her, he's going to need a lot of love, you know, to get through this. He'll really need to lean on you. And she didn't say a thing. She had the chance to tell me what really happened because we both left the house to get some fish and chips or something to eat. So we went to the pub, we walked up the road to where the checkers is and we got some food from there. And then we brought it back to the house. She had all that time to tell me that something was wrong and she didn't. She had every opportunity at that point to say, well, David, you know, it isn't true. Jeremy actually killed them. And she didn't say that. She didn't say a thing, nothing. But Julie alleged her first opportunity to discuss Jeremy's involvement in the crime was on her return to her house on the 27th of August 1985 and that she told her friend Sue over the next few days and also told Liz. Odd then that neither of these friends went to the police there and then. There are similarities in evidence which suggest that Julie Mugford and the relatives colluded recently discovered comments which came from dear Stan Jones during the 2002 investigation where he says I'm saying Anne Eaton because she was in contact with Julie and myself we talked and so this would indicate that Julie Mugford and the relatives colluded and this is noticeable in respect of the following evidence the windows entry and exit the means of escape on a bicycle a wetsuit being involved, the sum of £2,000, the position of the Bible, comments regarding Sheila saying she was a white witch. And during the trial, Julie was asked if her information had actually not come from Jeremy, she claimed, 
but from the newspapers. And when I asked in court if she'd read any newspapers which had reported about the case, Julie Mugford lied again. She said, during question and answers at the trial, Jeremy had some newspaper cuttings, but they were newspapers that were not read. I did not have an opportunity to read the newspapers at that stage. Jeremy bought some papers which I glanced at, but I did not spend time sitting down and reading through them, no. I did not have time to look through the papers. Miss Mugford, are you really sure that this is right and you did not? I am absolutely positive that is right. But in her statements, she's given evidence that fairly early in the morning, I went with Jeremy to OC Road Caravan Site to purchase some groceries and get some national newspapers. Jeremy at the shop got about four or five newspapers, which covered the case. When we got back to his house, we looked through the papers. A few points in relation to what I have told Susan Battersby about the murders. I told her other things which I'd read in the papers and things said to me by various people. But again, the jury didn't see this contradictory evidence as it was not in the served copy of her statement. Consequently, she was allowed to lie at the trial without challenge. And there is more evidence that Julie Mugford obtained her knowledge from the media. In a witness statement from September 1985, Julie says that Jeremy had told her that the hitman had told him details about the number of shots fired into Neville Bamba. She said, During the struggle, Matthew had a mental blank and fired seven consecutive shots into his father. Also at the trial, Julie Mugford repeated the same number of shots to the jury. But this wasn't correct. According to the post-mortem, Neville had actually received eight gunshot wounds, but the newspapers had all incorrectly but widely reported that he had sustained seven. Julie Mugford had implicated Matthew MacDonald as the hitman who Jeremy instructed to carry out the murders. She claimed the hitman had then contacted Jeremy to tell him what had happened. When the police arrested Matthew MacDonald, he was found to have a cast iron alibi and was released without charge. However, what you may not know is that in 2002, Julie Mugford attempted to implicate another man as being involved. DC Cowell of the Met Police thought this information was worthy of reporting, so he did so in a message to DC West on the 18th of April. He stated that these additional issues were worthy of note. Julie Smachansky was asked, Susan Battersby states that you told her about Brett Collins being possibly involved in violent crime in New Zealand. Who told you? Are there any details? Jeremy told me that Brett had used a baseball bat to kill someone because they owed money. They lived together both in Australia, in Sydney and in New Zealand. But the offences were in New Zealand. I believe Brett's brother was dealing in drugs in Europe and I was led to believe that Brett, through his brother, could get fake passports to allow him to move about. Then Julie was asked if Jeremy could have confided in Brett. Yes, I believe Brett was consulted prior to the murders and that was my gut feeling. His arrival before the murders was bizarre and his return afterwards. He turned up suddenly. I feel that when Brett turned up, Jeremy changed. I did not like Brett, and it was a mutual dislike. I went to London when Brett was around. It's subjective, but he was not a nice man. Money and lifestyle were important to him. He had a crush on Jeremy. It was more than a friendship in my estimation. For me, I've got no real evidence, but feel sure he was involved. If there had been any truth... In these new allegations against Jeremy and Brett, it would be a logical assumption to make that she would have been happy to disclose this to Essex Police when she first incriminated Jeremy in the murders of his family in 1985. Of course, the suggestions were followed up and investigated, but Brett had never been charged with any incident involving killing a man with a baseball bat. Again, it seems that Julie Mugford repeated lies against someone else. This evidence really does suggest that Julie Mugford 
not only lied under oath and was not the credible witness portrayed by police, but also, very significantly, she repeatedly made false allegations against men. This pattern might indicate that Julie Mugford had a very specific agenda and shows characteristics of megalomania. As a key prosecution witness, the attention she received from police and media was emotionally valuable to her and therefore she found herself in a powerful position. And with this came more and more extreme lies. Sometime after the trial, Julie Mugford moved to Canada, became a teacher, married and had two children. But the marriage didn't last and it's rumoured that she was divorced in 2010. More recently, however, Julie was working as the Director of Assessments at Winnipeg Schools Division and recently awarded herself a healthy pay rise. Remember her own words about Jeremy. If he were dead, he would always be with me. And her life sentence in prison is very much a social death. Julie ensured that Jeremy Bamber would not be available to any other woman for the rest of his life.